Hi, Terry here. Um, this I'm going to be reacting to Mentor Washington's 2023 conference workshop on mentoring LGBTQ youth. Um, we do run an LGBTQ youth um, group at uh, one of our secure facilities, uh, juvenile detention. And so if you are currently running a group, this might be uh, a 101 level session for you. Uh, and you might want something a little bit more than that because I did attend this session the first time it was offered. Um, so if you want something more, I think I would exit out, but this is a great 101 level if you are trying to figure out how you're going to work with LGBTQ youth uh, if you are from an inexperienced background. So here we go. Let me get the technology working. We are kind of jumping into uh, the start of um, after the introductions were made because there was a it was took up way too much time. So here, so many buttons to press to get this to work properly. All right, here we go. Um, so like I said, uh, so this is my team. I am so, so happy to have as fantastic and fabulous a team as I get to have here. Um, so I'm, I'm missing the uh, screen on my side. So if anybody has a question or needs me to stop, I am a bit of a motor mouth. I'm a fast talking Philly boy. Um, come off mute and say like, stop, because I actually can't see the chat at this moment while I'm presenting. So feel free to stop me. This is my fantastic team. I'm lucky, as I said, to have a full-time team. Um, I am headquartered here in Philadelphia, and I've been a social worker for the past 15 years. I've been a licensed social worker for 20, since 2014, um, and about 12 of those 15 years of my career was spent in child welfare. So primarily foster care, um, and also working for a nonprofit law firm where we represented survivor, young survivors of abuse and neglect throughout various jurisdictions of the court. That all means that I have a high degree of experience and specialization in trauma and resilience in children, youth, and families. Um, I've trained through the PA Bar Institute and also through the Mayor's Office of LGBT Affairs, which is something in Philadelphia we're really lucky to have. Um, I've been at Big Brothers Big Sisters since March of 2020, which I don't know if you remember, but in about March of 2020, there was like this thing that happened that made it a really interesting time to be starting in a school-based program. <laughs> So, um, we are going to talk about that all over the place. Um, sorry, 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 sorry. Uh, uh, and, um, yeah, so this is our service area, right? So we are headquartered here in Philadelphia. This is this tiny little county in the middle, but approximately 2.1 million people live in the tiniest county in this enormous service area that we're lucky to have. Uh, so Tim, we your beautiful face. Go one slide down. One more, what's that? You're not in, you're not in presentation mode. So there you go. You got it. Okay, gorgeous. Thank you. I'm just gonna move this this way then. Um, and while I am here, actually, is there a way to make it bigger? Is that better, folks? My apologies. I was messing around with this, and I thought that I had figured out all the things I needed to figure out. I'm also gonna draw go. That's in great. at the a uh, link to the Google Drive that is available to all of you. There are a lot of really handy resources in there as well. So not just the slide deck, but all So I have downloaded all the uh, stuff that he has on the Google Drive. So if you want it, let me know. I can share it. Also, all of the documents that I'm going to be referencing, a lot of the really peer reviewed evidence-based practice that, you're, that you'll see me referencing, um, in addition to our program logic models and examples of what program looks like. So so go ahead and click on that link. It should be made shareable. Um, and uh, you'll be able to either follow along at your leisure and be able to reference this kind of after we're done as well. Cool. So this is our enormous service area. Uh, that qualifies us as sort of one of the larger agencies in terms of Big Brothers Big Sisters. Um, we have a staff of about 80. Um, and uh, we have a combination of community-based one-on-one programs that you're used to thinking about when you think about Big Brothers Big Sisters. And also a mix of school-based programs, including Beyond School Walls and Mentor 2.0, and, uh, and then now our LGBTQ program, which works in groups 
group mentoring, um, particularly in GSA spaces, and I'm going to tell you all about over the next couple of few minutes. So while we're setting the table, I want to put up this quote on the screen, which I love. We have a mantra here um, that all of our DEI work needs to be focused about calling people in instead of calling people out. And this quote captures that really well, particularly with LGBT plus youth um, and in both directions, right? So sometimes what makes us not so confident to interact with our young people is feeling like the accountability is going to be more of a call out and is going to feel pretty sharp, right? So we're reminding our young people as often as we're reminding our elders that we need to call people in and that when we do criticism really well and the most really the most loving thing that you can do is offer someone a critique because what you're doing underneath of that is inviting them to stay and continue to be a part of your life. Hey, ouch. And I heard you say that, that felt kind of gross. So what I need you to do in order to uh, feel like you're a safe person who's going to respect and acknowledge me for who I am is the following, right? Um, and that sounds very simple, but I think as the climate in the world today has shown us, it's really difficult. When we are reacting instead of responding, we're really missing an opportunity to have an important conversation. And the most important part of this quote for me is down at the bottom is because our lives depend on getting the right answers. So particularly for queer and trans youth right now, their lives depend on us getting it right. Um, so as the elders in the room, I'm going to invite us to reflect on that at greater length. That is going to lead us right into this Trevor Project data, right? So this comes straight from the Trevor Project. Uh, I didn't even amend the slides anything at all. So they're properly cited, hopefully properly cited at the bottom of the corner of the screen here. And one of the things that is really pretty scary, but probably not surprising, particularly to this group of folks, is that more than 1.8 million LGBTQ plus youth from age 13 to 24 have seriously considered suicide in the past year. So that equates to one queer or trans person attempting an act of suicide once every 45 seconds. So once every 45 seconds is insane, is an epidemic <laughs> of proportions that we have only very recently seen. So 13 to 24. Feel I think that number is rising right now from what it was, um, what I heard of uh, the numbers about 10 years ago. Feels in range, but our brains aren't fully baked until we're 25, right? So that's what we've come, developmental psychologists have come to think of that as young adulthood between 13 to 24. Uh, your brains are changing rapidly and not quite done until about 24. Prior to 2020, the three leading preventable causes of death, according to the CDC, were car accidents, drowning, and then suicide. Suicide, we know, made up by a disproportionately high amount of queer and trans youth. Post-2020, the top two leading preventable causes of death, according to the CDC, are now gun violence and suicide. That's wild. So once every 45 seconds is going in the absolute wrong direction. And this is not just in America, right? So more than 40 million LGBT plus youth worldwide consider dying by suicide every single year, which is why it's so important for us to get it right. COVID obviously didn't help. A lot of young people um, reported that, and this is just COVID specific, we're not even now talking about the amount of legislation that's been introduced throughout the country, um, but COVID itself was a really challenging time. That is not news, it's not even controversial to say. A lot of our queer and trans youth were then asked to shelter in place in homes that may have been non-affirming or worse. Um, so that was not a good situation for anyone in the best of cases, much less for queer and trans youth who may have had to go even deeper in a closet and not have had access to these outlets and social supports uh, that may have been those protective factors to kind of avoid some of those scary things we were just talking about. Then, of course, 2022 saw over 300 anti-trans legislation across the country. We are well past that now in the month of May. I have lost track. I have tried to find websites that keep an accurate track of, and even websites whose full-time job is to keep track of it, have lost track of just how many coordinated attacks there are in queer and trans youth. 
Um, so that equates certainly to around 93% of those folks who are surveyed are really significantly worried about their access to care, not just medical care, but mental health care. So if we're then talking about mental health and that getting worse, we might say, well, then go to therapy. Well, 60% of those youth who the Trevor Project surveyed in 2021 through 2022 said they wanted to, but couldn't actually get access to it. For the adults in the room who may have had to make those referrals and linkages, we know that those waiting lists are long and that insurance companies are often um, uh, you know, enamored <laughs> with lots of hoops for us to jump through and prior authorizations and certifications and all of that kind of stuff and in-network coverage, out-of-network coverage. And then are you assigned to a kind of clinician who is... Uh, has enough cultural humility and understanding of queer and trans students to actually be effective in the kind of therapy if you're actually getting there. And what 17% of those youth who reported, um, uh, who responded to this Trevor Project survey said that they were actually then subjected to conversion therapy. Conversion therapy is a life-threatening intervention that form of indoctrination, in fact, that is specifically targeting uh, queer and trans youth in an attempt to make them personal story. My best friend was forced to go to conversion therapy when she was younger. It is horrific. There is a performer, uh, his name is Peterson Toscano. Um, you can find some YouTube videos from him where he talks about his experiences with conversion therapy. It is, um, harmful and people do don't walk away from it in a better place they walk away from it in a worse place them or convince them that they are actually cisgender and heterosexual when we think about all of those scary stats in perception of the, the world and its hostility towards queer and trans youth the barriers to then accessing care and then for those who have gone through all of that, to have bravely asked for help, to have been able to seek it, to then be subjected to this form of therapy, which the AMA, the ADA, all of the professional youth serving organizations, peer reviewed, evidence based, scientific professional organizations that you. I believe that conversion therapy is against the law in Washington state also. Evidence with which to inform their practice say, this is a dangerous and unethical practice, still about one in five of those youth find themselves in conversion therapy. Well, surely if all of these professional organizations say that this is a wildly unethical and dangerous practice that could drive somebody teetering on the edge to an active... Yeah, I just found it. Um, the U.S. Appeals Court upheld Washington State's conversion therapy ban Then it must be illegal nationwide, you say. Of course not. Washington, good on you. You did something about it. Here in Pennsylvania, we got nothing. That is not an outlaw practice, despite the overwhelming mountain of evidence about the harm that it creates and perpetrates against queer and trans youth. Now, that is all not to say that LGBTQ youth are inherently prone to suicide or risk because of sex and genderality. I see your hand raised, actually. Oh, it's shaking. That's so interesting. <laughs> Before I get into it, why don't you come off mute and ask me a question, my friend? Hey, is there, shaking. That's that, fun. is there any way that we can make the presentation a little larger? I'm having a little bit of trouble seeing the writing. Yeah, I am sorry, my friend. I thought when I shared my screen, um, so what, I kind of disappear when I heard do the screen, but is that better? Yeah, thank you so much. I really appreciate you. Also, yeah, no, thank you for saying that. I'm sorry to interject. Do you see at the bottom where there's like a book and then there's something next to it that looks like um, a goblet? If you click on the goblet, it goes into full screen. Yeah, the, so the slideshow kicks out my face, and I'm fine with that, but I won't be able to see your questions in the chat. Uh, oh, I see. I'm sorry. I'm fine with this. So, like, just come off mute if you have questions. How about that? Because I think this is probably then easier, and, you know, just holler at me. I'm a Philly boy. Like, I'm not going to be offended if you come off mute and you're like, yo. So <laughs> I just won't be able to see the questions in the chat. So just, like, somebody kind of stop me if I'm in the middle of it. Is that good? I think this yeah, is I, I, I can help you with chat, no problem. 
Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Um, so all the you if you youth aren't oh also in the chat is the link to the uh, Google Drive that has a copy of these slides in addition to a bunch of other resources too. So if you want to follow along um, or if there's something that makes it easier for you to follow along, you can click and open that in a separate window as well. So um, all of this crazy therapy and mental health stuff, it's, it's not because LGBTQ youth are inherently prone to suicide risk because of their sexual orientation or their gender identity. But rather, we're placed at that higher risk because of how we're mistreated and stigmatized in society. So that is essentially the one sentence sum. Research shows that if LGBTQ youth who are have suicidal ideation they have four supportive accepting adults in their lives, their uh, suicidal ideation as a group comes down to match their peers. So it becomes just the same as anybody else. So the suicidal ideation is connected to being rejected by the people that are close to them in their, in their life. The minority stress model is. The minority stress model, if we've never heard of it before, is essentially describing intersectionality meaning that we each have layers of identity that in each of those layers of identity have a relationship to the world around us that contributes to risk and protective factors that puts us at more or less risk of certain health and disparities, mental health outcomes, or even any kind of excessive stress in a social climate than other um, layers of identities and the way that they interact with the world around us. So intersectionality, we're talking about Kimberly Crenshaw. And instead of me sitting here trying to sort of like mansplain <laughs> what Kimberly Crenshaw meant when she was talking about intersectionality, I'm going to go ahead and let the expert do the speaking for herself, which means I do have to come out of this for just a second. I know I said I wasn't going to do that. But we will let her speak for herself she does a better job of explaining it in 30 seconds than I would be able to do in 90 minutes. Everyone can hear okay? Yep, we're good. Perfect. So. Sorry. Sorry. Intersectionality is just a metaphor understanding the ways that mo oh, I'm sorry 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 we're not gonna make her sorry over again intersectionality is just a metaphor for understanding the ways that multiple forms of inequality or disadvantage sometimes compound themselves and they create obstacles that often are not understood within conventional ways of thinking about anti-racism or feminism or whatever social justice advocacy structures we have. Intersectionality isn't so much a grand theory, it's a prism for understanding certain kinds of problems. African American girls are six times more likely to be suspended than white girls. That's probably a race and a gender problem. It's not just a race problem, it's not just a gender problem. So I encourage people to think about how the convergence of race stereotypes or gender stereotypes might actually play out in the classroom between teachers and students, between students and other students, between students and administrators, and commit themselves to understanding that as a way of intervening and providing equal educational opportunity for all students, regardless of their identity. Identity isn't simply a self-contained unit. It is a relationship between people in history, people in communities, people in institutions. So schools do a good job when they understand that and when they commit themselves to curricular development, to opportunities in the school for all students to understand the histories that have brought us to this particular moment. You can't change outcomes without understanding how they've come about. So independent schools can take the lead on that to be responsive to their student populations and to the communities out of which the students come. So again, in two minutes, Kimberly Crenshaw explained better and more succinctly 
this concept that she developed as a young lawyer coming out of Columbia Law School um, much faster than I would be able to do had I attempted to do that myself. So what, just summarily, talking about intersectionality, I love how she talks about these layers of identity and their relationship to the world around us. So we each have layers of identity in our family, in our sexual orientation, our gender identity, our racial self, our ethnic self, then also our class, our religion. I'm a brother, I'm a son, I am a friend, I'm a partner. Um, those are all different layers of my identity that show up differently um, based on where I am in the world or how I move out about the world uh, in Philadelphia or when I'm home in Delaware County. Um, this line down the bottom, I think is really important too, because we are still human beings with this brain that is wired to make us um, perceive threats to our survival. So as we're thinking about each of these identities, we are often leading through the world of that most vulnerable part of ourselves. And sometimes that can create either blind spots about uh, around how the world then interacts with others or how layers of identity of somebody else might have a different relationship with the world than ourselves, um, or also some implicit biases that we may have learned in an observation that might be regionally specific and not necessarily globally specific. That can be also through different layers of our of our family or how our neighborhoods or church groups perceive different folks of different identities. This is definitely that same circle that's asking us to think about different layers of our identity from that personal microsystem, right, which is our individual self, that sex age or health, to that microsystem, those things that we interact with more regularly, and that exosystem of media and legal services and neighbors and friends and family that are a little bit more distant or distal from that central self. And in that macro system, which is then our culture and identity in the world, the country that we live in, the part of the world that we live in. Um, and what I love is that it sort of has then flipped it on its side and also asked us to think about our chrono system, right? So, and when we were doing that word cloud, a lot of folks registered that it's better or in a lot of ways, being of a queer and trans identity is better or easier than it ever has been. For example, even just having the access to the language with which to name these identities is a significant improvement that exists in 2023 that most certainly did not exist in 1923. So those are all different thoughts and considerations to take in when we talk about intersectionality and how it shows up in the work. Specifically, when I think about going and interacting with my middle school and high school students who are sick of hearing me talk about how I went to Blockbuster on a Friday and it was like the best day ever, or like had a Nokia brick phone <laughs> that like you couldn't kill if you run, ran over with your car, or like didn't have a text message until like junior of high school. <laughs> they grew up in a time and in a place when they were uh, uh, a different version of the internet even um, that has allowed this access to information that has in many ways improved their lives with, with being able to access information and understanding. Um, to be able to access language is like really key in being able to be able to name these identities. That said, there's never been a, a bigger gap in the generational knowledge between young people and adults, because we did not grow up with that information. And But the exciting thing for me is that I am learning from our young people and our students every single day. I think this is where humility comes in when you go from adult to youth. There is gaps in knowledge between every generation. So being willing to learn from youth and youth being willing to learn from the adult, both of those things are necessary to have a good mentoring relationship. I was sick of hearing me tell the story, but when I was considering, we were listening to what our high school students were telling us when they say, hey, I wish I had access to this GSA space earlier. And I thought, oh man, are middle school folks like really ready for this kind of stuff? So I did a town hall 
at a performing arts high school here in Philadelphia. I figured that was a safe bet that there are probably some queer children in a musical theater program at a performing arts high school in Philadelphia. And did my little presentation of my little gender unicorn that we'll show you in a couple slides and it's in that Google Drive as a resource for you later. I was like, oh man, do I have, does anyone have any questions? And I'm like, here we go. Um, and one of those students was like, yeah, it's like valid that you identify as gay, but it's you're actually technically omnisexual because it's not that you don't have attractions to women, it's that you prefer to date men. And I was like, oh, okay, cool. Isn't it cool that we all like can identify whatever like makes sense for us? Like, are there any other questions? And another sixth or seventh grader was like, yeah, I think I'm abrosexual. Am I using that term correctly? And I was like, all right, like, I don't... <laughs> I don't know what that means. <laughs> so even somebody who is professionally queer all day, every day, like there is a lot of stuff that I don't know and get to learn from our young people. And part of that means that I got to get out of my way in remembering that Gen Z grew up with offering pronouns. So we grew up with don't ask, don't tell, which we deeply then internalized me to. I think that's so important that to remember that we really grew up with that. My generation grew up with don't ask, don't tell. And the younger generation now grew up with a, all the information at their fingertips. So there was nothing hidden that the, this is like a topic that's off limits or that it's a sensitive subject or that we shouldn't really like approach it or shouldn't be proactive in talking about it. Um, Gen Z is wondering why we're not offering our pronouns. And in fact, they're already receiving messages from us if we're not, because the message that then we're receiving is that we are uncomfortable having that conversation. So we are not gonna create a situation where they're able to then open up to us about that, about their own discoveries or questions about gender and identity if we're not proving to them ahead of time and being proactive about demonstrating ways in which we are comfortable having these conversations. Um, I, I think the overt homophobic and transphobic language in the media and the TV that I grew up loving in the 90s was not as apparent to me <laughs> until recent rewatches, right? Um, having an LGBTQ role model in media and TV today and that there are so many um, is a beautiful and amazing and wonderful thing. Uh, I, I don't know if anyone else has an emotional support show that it's like, you know, was on in 1995 for like 27 seasons. Um, but going back and watching some of those, I, I, was, I was watching ER because I'm a nerd and was they were treating a patient who was a sex worker and, um, and she was trans, uh, and the language that they were using to describe this character that they had created, they were not only misgendering this character, they were using different language than trans, and they couldn't stop talking about AIDS. And it was like, wow, <laughs> ER, no wonder. Uh, uh, but those are all things that as a young person watching that I didn't notice then, but definitely deeply internalized in a way that affected who I became today. Um, and that is very different, I'm happy to say, than for Gen Z growing up today with queer role models that they can see on TV who represent them. Um, it's part of, we say representation matters because we know that it does. So this is all information. Um, let me stop for just like a moment um, and see if anyone has any questions before we move into like, what is actually my program and what do I actually do here every day? Any thoughts or questions about? I'm gonna pause right here because I have another meeting that I need to go to and uh, I'll be back and start with the actual program that he runs uh, later on today. So I'll see you. Hi, I'm back from my meeting and back from lunch and ready to continue with uh, reacting to Mentor Washington's um, workshop on doing group mentoring with LGBTQ youth. The first half, which is the separate recording, um, was largely about why group mentoring is needed. And it's because our LGBTQ youth, and especially our trans youth, are among our most uh, at risk youth for harm in our uh, kind of in our nation. 
So the second half is actually about the program that Tim runs. So we're going to start off with uh, building a program. That's uh, this next section. So let's get going. I have to press now all the buttons to be able to um, make this happen. It's so much fun. I think we're there. Great. So I should be here. The presentation is here or something like that. And now we're going to go on with building a program. If this is sort of data piece that we've chatted through so far. Oh, let me make it big. Y'all with me? Cool. That was like the heavy part. So <laughs> it gets more fun from here, I promise. So if you've made it this far, we are good to go. What does it mean? What do I do? So we're doing group mentoring in GSA spaces. And this didn't happen suddenly. It happened. GSA is Gay Straight Alliance three phases that really started back in 2016. So in phase one, this is really that pilot phase where we're doing our homework. Like, what does the research say? And as we just reviewed that changing literature and keeping up with the literature is also something that you're going to want to keep in mind if you're um, wherever you're at in this work is that it changes and rapidly um, and is a part of making sure that you're creating meaningful and impactful programming by keeping up with the information as it's coming out. One of the foundational documents that we used was this supplement from Mentor, uh, authored, co-authored by Dr. Christian Rummel, who was also the chief consultant on the Big Brothers Big Sisters of America National Initiative to um, enhance our capacity to respond to queer and trans littles. This elements of effective practice for mentoring is also in the Google Drive and absolutely positively deserves very thorough attention if you're uh, thinking about getting into the work or are already. It does a very clear and specific job about breaking down program in each of these areas that were really incredibly helpful. And really quick, um, I want to show you where the elements of effective practice for mentoring are. Um, over, if you can see this uh, website, we have um, elements of effective practice for mentoring. And if you scroll down, you can download a copy and information about that. So it's a pretty dense document if you want to read it in your spare time. Again, ways from program design to recruitment and screening of volunteers and finding out which volunteers are coachable and finding out which ones could potentially do some harm. And not just in our LGBTQ programs, but in all of our programs. Um, what is the training that then we can offer those folks who are coachable and how are we matching? We have this binary in our name. So there's a lot of non-binary folks that think and assume that they are not welcome at our agency. Um, and then how are we kind of monitoring and making sure that we're delivering this program that we've designed and created with fidelity? What are the evaluations that we're doing to make sure that we're doing well? What are the uh, indicators of success that we're using as an output or as an outcome for any of our mentoring programs? And then what are we doing during closure process? Closure, as we know in mentoring, is really important that we do that well. Um, or else it has the potential to do pretty uh, some significant harm. So among the key takeaways from the elements of effective practice that I really want to highlight are, and again, Dr. Christian Rummel, as part of his uh, doctorate uh, research thesis, um, did this, what is thought to be the largest survey of LGBTQ specific mentoring programs in the country. And this was in 2013. I was not expecting this number to be high, but he surveyed 5,000 programs, and only five of those had any kind of work specific to LGBTQ plus youth. That was wild to me, and my bar was pretty, pretty low <laughs> what I was expecting those results to be. We were not in that survey, and we have programming specific to that, so we can say it's at least six. Um, so really what that comes down to is that about 89% of all of our at-risk youth um, are growing, out with any, growing up without any formal type of mentor. And then when he went on to explain, like, so a mentor is, you know, such and such a person who you can rely on and feel safe and supported by, still about a third of those folks couldn't really identify a person that they thought of in a mentor capacity. I know myself as a young queer person could not think of somebody who uh, would have fit that criteria as well growing up. 
So all of this homework, like, what do I do with this information? I told you I'm a social worker. So forever, you know, I can live in this world of information and research, but like, what do I do with it in practice? I am where the rub social workers, in my opinion, are where the rubber meets the road. What are we doing with this information? So the first thing we did in phase one was to degender a lot of our policies and also come up with these two really critical things that have been integral to our success, not just in our LGBT specific program, but into the agency as a whole. It's important that these things are baked into the bones of the agency so people know that we're not just doing sort of performative allyship. DEI, Jedi work is deeply embedded into everything that we do. So our agency match policy, we consider this our open gender matching policy. And it's really the policy that's always been where we're going to make the most appropriate match that we can. Um, that has always been our policy. We added a tiny bit of language where this is something else that we're also going to consider when we're making a match. Um, Tim, whether, I'm sorry. Is there a slide to go with this? Are you seeing the internal policy? We don't see building a program. Oh, my gosh. Come on. There we go. There we go. All right. Sorry. We'll do it this way then. I had all these like other ones that we were flying through then. Sorry about that. So we're... Okay. Sorry about this. Um, so this is our open gender matching policy, right? We're going to make the best match possible. If that means a non-binary person who was assigned female at birth with a little brother, then that's what we're going to do. Um, again, we're consulting with the parents too, right? We want to make sure the volunteer is having a good experience. So if there's a possibility of experiencing homophobia or transphobia, we're not going to make that match. Um, but that said, you know, there's nothing, there's no reason why we can't make matches cross-gender if they're what makes the most sense. Uh, and we have a couple of those here and they've been a great success. And a lot of our parents were really grateful that we just kind of made a match based off of mutual interest um, instead of just gender, which is a little bit more arbitrary. Our match support policy, we have no secrets in match support except for this one, <laughs> where if you come out to us, we're not going to out you. The, per, um, the process of coming out is much different than being outed. Being outed is a violent, dangerous thing that can happen to a young person that can contribute to rejection, ejection from a home in a way that we are not going to contribute to. So this is the one secret that we'll keep, and it's because we, pro we put child safety first above all else. And it's a very clear, no one's ever actually pushed back on that either, which you're kind of like, I'm going to keep this one secret. And everyone's like, no, it makes total sense, child safety. Um, so when I talked about also like uh, interviews, so every single one of our interviews gets asked this question that I asked you at the beginning is, are, are you feel comfortable being matched to an LGBT blessed little? And the follow up question is, are you not comfortable or are you not confident? Because somebody who's like, oh, I'm not confident. I got any help. They're like, well, the language is crazy and I don't even understand it. Cool. You're coachable. Come on in. Um, if somebody's like, hey, no, this is a deeply held personal belief and not something that they're like willing to examine or interrogate at any great length. We've informed our enrollment specialists. They are welcome to politely end the interview with that. You're not going to be a good match with us. Big Brothers Big Sisters of America has information that says 83% of our out LGBT youth across the country come out after enrolling in our programs, which makes sense when we're enrolling as folks as young as seven. And of those out LGBT youth who come out after enrolling in our program, 54%, more than half, come out to their big or to a staff person first. That's wild. <laughs> That's also amazing and I think speaks to the power and potential that can come through a mentoring relationship. We're creating these really sacred spaces for youth to be really vulnerable and tell a trusted adult this piece of information that then we have to get right. We have a responsibility to get it right. So I'm sorry, but if this is your belief, you are welcome to have it. There are other programs for you to be able to volunteer with. No one has a right to volunteer and no one has a right to do harm to a child because of your personal beliefs. Mm -hmm. Sorry, not sorry. <laughs> so phase two comes like, cool, we did this work internally. We cleaned up our side of the street before we went. I mean, do no harm should be the lowest bar that we can achieve, right? Somebody else how what their side of the street should look like and started then doing our outward facing work <laughs> slow clap thank you susanna um i like being able to see the chat again i'm sorry like i'm not in a full screen and what's going on, but i do like to be able to see that so this is where then we started then going into our gsas and when we're talking about our gsas it's all of this this is our program logic model so i did spend the time to do this 
Um, in grad school, I remember they were like, here's a logic model. And I was like, no one ever like actually does that. I'm like, I'm not gonna pay attention. Um, and then when I came in and I was like, what should we do? And they were like, we should really do a logic model. And I like threw up in my mouth a little bit. and was like, Ugh. Um, <laughs> cannot recommend this enough. This was really helpful in helping us make decisions about what our program is and what it isn't. This was the key piece that helps us prevent mission drift. There are a number of different things that affect queer and trans folks. There are only so many that I can do from within a mentoring program. So then we start with the end in mind about like, what are those indicators of success? And at the end of having been a part of our GSA spaces, what do we hope that you will, you will have achieved or we will have increased or we will have affected? Logic models are so important and they're way easier than school makes you think once you're in something that you know what's going in and what's coming out. And ideally, when you're thinking about your outputs, I would think about trying to create a one-on-one -on -one relationship between your inputs and your outputs in this, in this uh, situation. That's going to make it a lot easier for you to try and figure out what it is that you're going to be measuring. And when you have a really clear set uh, of inputs and activities that lead to a really clear output and outcome, it makes the conversation with funders and grantors much more easy when you can say, hey, here's this data about like how this is working. Folks are really familiar with the doom and gloom stats that come with queer and, tr queer and trans youth. They really want to hear about solutions and we're really uniquely suited to be a part of that. Part of what then I just said about like what it is and what it isn't, while also recognizing that there is a whole set of needs that queer and trans youth have is that we kind of have developed um, this agency philosophy of being the hub of the wheel. We're not gonna reinvent the wheel, we are gonna be the hub of it. Um, we can, who can we spin out to other community resources that have been doing things better and longer than we are that also are in fact and important to our young people who are coming into our programs. Um, so mental health supports, who are our queer health providers, and we do a number of different ways to make sure that our youth get connected to those. When it boils down to it, my program has three big buckets. The mentoring, of course, then there is the resource connection, where there is a compendium of resources available to our students all over Philadelphia that I wanna make sure our students know is available to them outside of their time at school. Um, and then third is this sort of coalition building with other organizations um, who are already engaged in the work. Um, and um, um, what, how can we take the power of the brand and leverage that in order to create these coalitions where, you know, high tides raises all boats. So if there's a small um, organization that's doing really great work, how can we uplift what they're doing and connect our students to that work that is really important to those students? So then that boiled down to who, what, where, how, and when. So our theory of change then became by matching mentors that reflect that identify within the community and reflect the racially diverse, gender expansive and lived experience of our students, we can unlock that power and potential of our young queer and trans youth everywhere. Boom, that's it. You, if you can't say it in one sentence, then you don't know what your program is. Um, and this was a really, really helpful process. Again, all of this is in the folder. I'm gonna encourage you to like look at it at a greater length. So that theory of change then also comes from this piece of information from the Trevor Project that says, if you just have four consistent and affirming adults in your life, we can reduce that risk of suicidality comparable to a rate of your cis or peers, right? So I'm gonna make that a little bit bigger. That rate that we were looking at in 2019 was about 17% for cis hetero youth. With four accepting and affirming adults, we can raise that down to 13. So that means, that our model, that means that I can, that is information I can do something with right now with the resources I have available to me today. And particularly from a mentoring program where if I'm gonna take two mentors and match them to the GSA space itself, instead of making a one-on-one -on -one match. So that's where the group mentoring comes in. And then my program coordinator, who's gonna co-facilitate that space and uplift and elevate whatever is going on by the faculty advisor, who is our pathway of permission with which to interact with these children all together. The faculty advisor is absolutely critical in that we have a memorandum of understanding with the district that says we're an approved providers and our volunteers meet the standards and the screening of the district to be able to come in at the invitation of that faculty advisor, um, because at the beginning of the year, you know, 
you get that stack of paperwork. I don't even know if it's a stack of paperwork anymore. Maybe it's a Google form. I don't know. But you sign all these permission slips at the beginning of the year. And one of them says, I give my kiddo permission to attend an after school program that's facilitated by a faculty advisor. That allows us to enter into that space at the invitation without formally enrolling these young people into our program, which means that they don't have to have a conversation with a parent that they're not ready to have. They get to come and go as they please. Huh. They get to get what they came for and they get to leave the rest if it's not for them. Cool, love it. Choose your own adventure. Um, so that has been really critical and there's some data stuff that we can talk through later as well. Cause you're like, well, then that doesn't count towards your total children served. It didn't at first until now. And I'm happy to answer those questions later. Um, so questions so far, I know I'm running out of time and I wanna show you a little bit of what a program looks like. And I do have a fun activity that I hope we have time to be able to do. So your program is during the school day with the GSA club or after school? Uh, they're generally sort of after school, but some of them sort of do it differently. So, um, one of our one of our partner programs has has it as like a mini course they call it, but it's really an elective. So like a lot of different other people sign up. So there's like a pottery class, and you could just sign up for a pottery class. There's really not a lot to react to in this video. It's just pretty basic information all the way around. But it's like during their school day. It's like the last period of the day. Um, most of them are after school. We've had in the past folks who are like, hey, my freshman elective block scheduling funky thing is it like first period seven in the morning. Um, and that's our other mantra in this program is that we find a way to yes. So we will find a way to ask this adult person to get up in the morning and get their butt into a high school classroom by 7 a.m. And they did. Um, and that was a really great experience for, for all of us, including, uh, including the adults. So it was great. So thank you for your question. Anything else? Anything cool. So what does a program look like? Great question. Thank you for asking. I'd love to tell you. So um, these are just some examples of when we were virtual. And I will say that there was uh, a couple advantages of being virtual. And in fact, we did also then launch a virtual district-wide GSA while, during 2020 and 21 and 20 during the pandemic. And um, we had over 200 students from 46 different high schools sign up. And the thing was like, hey, if we're all meeting online and we know that you need connection now more than ever, we're going to offer this to you, um, whether or not you have a GSA in your school or not. And it was a huge success. And also we're finding out much more accessible for our neurodiverse folk um, and more neurodivergent folk who wanna, who appreciate being able to control the volume or for folks who aren't ready to have people see their face or, you know, there's a lot of advantages to that. And it's been sort of hit or miss post pandemic, but um, we're primarily serving our neurodiverse folk through our virtual stuff. But in the meantime, these were some virtual activities that we were able to then facilitate while we were doing this. And this is again, kind of like leveraging um, the power of the brand to then go to the school district and be like, hey, we asked our school, our students in GSA, what they would need to feel safe at school. And this is what they came up with. So this was a jam board and um, they, these are directly from the students. We put it up on the screen, they typed in their response and we handed it over to the district and said, this is what we need. And it started a really important conversation that has become the GSA advisory board at the district level. Um, so Black History Month, cool. Here's a bunch of queer folks who are also black. Let's talk about James Baldwin. Let's talk about Bayard Rustin. Let's talk about Angela Davis. Um, so then these are some vision boards that those folks did and then told us about who they were. For Women's History Month, we did the same thing. And we said, hey, why don't you pick a person, this queer person, uh, queer female identified person, um, and tell us what you think they would be like today, right? Because you secretly have to like learn a little about who they were and what they were like today. Um, and this one about uh, uh, Frida Kahlo cracks me up, I think, the most. <laughs> Because <laughs> um, they were like, Frida Kahlo would be non-binary, they would love high-waisted pants, flower crowns, and be really active in abolishing ice. And I was like, you are absolutely correct about all of that. <laughs> there was another slide I couldn't find, but somebody was like, Emily Dickinson would live in a loft apartment and be have a lot of cats and be really into tea. And I was like, I think that is also co really correct. <laughs> so it was a really fun activity that we were all able to do 
um, and, and and something that like you know kind of snuck in a little bit of learning there at the end of it. Um, I don't think we're gonna have time to do my Kahoot activity, but if you know Kahoot, they're so fun. It's another opportunity to sort of log in from your phone, uh, where then everyone participates together, and they absolutely love it. Um, so this is bringing us to sort of phase three, and I, I'm sorry that I like I'm a chatty Kathy and ran out of time. Where these are like all the really, all the beautiful, really beautiful forward facing things we did. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Somebody came off mute. I'm, I missed a question. It was an accidental on mute. Oh, my bad. Thanks, friend. Um, so how do we know? Like, here's the increase in our attendance. In our first year in 2018, when we started in our GSAs, we were reaching about 15 kids. Um, last year, we reached well over 200. Um, this year, we have 120 specifically in our GSAs, which I'm happy to chat through some SOGI data collection in a different session, um, and also our public-facing events that we do. How do they know? Well, here's some direct quotes from some of our chats um, that we've had that we had virtually. I This personally is my favorite line with, like, not to be dramatic, but I would, like, die for y'all. I'm like, I love that. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, I think a lot of these things are things that we that we know about. You know, I just haven't like, learned about it. Um, and some of these folks in 2020 were like, oh, I just feel so safe and accepted right now. Um, this one was really intense. <laughs> that one felt really good at a time during 2020 when folks were, were really, um, you know, in need of connection. And these really speak to then the continued need for us to be able to have these spaces in a way that protects privacy and confidentiality. These are brave spaces where you can come to be brave and get questions asked without fear of retribution. Yeah, there's a concept. Uh, we often talk about having safe spaces uh, to be with youth, but if we reframe our thinking a little bit to having brave spaces, and this works in all contexts, not just with uh, queer youth, but having brave spaces where you can have real, true, brave conversations, not uh, a kind of glossed over safety, because brave conversations are risky. So yeah, they can be hard. And that is, I think, the most important part of the program that we were able to develop together, is figuring out how to do that. Lessons learned is a professional way to say, here's where all the ways I messed up. <laughs> um, our faculty advisor is absolutely critical, as we know, right? So they are our pathway to permission to access these youth. More often than not, it is an English teacher <laughs> who is like, please help. I have like 20 queer children nipping at my ankles who like won't leave me alone. Like, please help. We're like, cool. Like, you're going to start a GSA and here's what we're going to do. And they really appreciate the lightening of the load when they have a lot going on themselves and like taking something else on um, feels prohibitive, but also like important for these students who are naturally gravitating toward them. Um, so they are really, really uh, critical in having that success. Not every school even though there are young people who are ready to have a GSA at the school, not every school is ready to host a GSA. So doing some assessment around that climate and whether or not that school is ready yet to host a GSA is an important consideration um, for the faculty advisor as well. I'm thinking of a faculty advisor who ultimately left his job after experiencing homophobia, not just from students, but from staff. So there was uh, some... That actually led to the formation of our virtual district-wide GSA, where we said, hey, the, there are still students there that need to access this. Um, so this is, I'm going to full screen this one at least, because can we see that OK? Um, it's not it's full not screen. Full it's, screen. It's, it's, Excel, it's Excel, though. though. What is it's the right. platform. Sorry, folks. OK, well, here is uh, an example of that coalition building that I was talking about, right? So these are the organizations who are doing um, the work of queer youth, either uh, healthcare or activities or clothing closets or any of these things. And we invited them all to come to this now annual party. We do a beginning of the year party and we do an end of the year party and we have a DJ and we have a drag performer. And each time we have about 150 kids show up and it is a blast and it is exactly what they need in order to feel like they're safe at school. 
And it happens at the 440 and the central office. It's actually the headquarters of the entire school district. And Philly schools are the eighth largest district in the, in the country. We have about 200,000 students who come to Philly. So there's a big symbolism of having it in the headquarters office in the middle of that atrium where it's loud and it's echoing and we're taking up space. There's a lot of symbolism that helps then people feel really safe at school when, when they are signing off on something like that. The coalition building also then lives and uh, that kind of led to this. So in Philly, we had um, I was part of the activists and organizers who reclaimed and reimagined pride in Philly. The previous organizers disbanded amidst some controversy is what we would say. And those of us came together and said, hey, there needs to be a spot for everyone at Pride. Pride was a protest, it shouldn't be a parade. And here, um, and it's more than just a block party with drinking, right? So Big Brothers Big Sisters helped and sponsored the youth and family space, which is the first ever that we did at Pride. Um, an enormous success. There was other affinity areas too, right? So we had Dragon Ballroom over here, an accessibility space over here. There was a sober space over here so that everybody could really be a part of Pride. And the agency really then being seen at Pride was also really important because the Pride Collective had a right to refuse. So anyone not aligned with the points of unity um, that they had set up didn't get to to come to Pride. And it was also no corporations, no cops, no corporations at Pride. So AT&T did not get to sell cell phones to us when you spend the rest of the year funding 90% of One America News's um, operating budget. Sorry, you can't sit with us. So that we were there was a really powerful endorsement of the agency and the work that we've done by the community to see at large, um, which resulted in more inquiries in a single day than the previous years combined. So that's what we talk about when earning trust and credibility within uh, the community that you serve in order to be able to serve them well. So I had a couple other things. I know I ran out of time. Uh, this QR code will also bring you to the um, Google Drive that has the slides for today, that has all of the other information and a lot of other peer-reviewed articles about that's important. All right, well, I am gonna stop this here because he's clearly at the end. Um, there's a lot of uh, interesting um, stuff that he shared uh, for, again, that, that beginner level um, of working with LGBTQ youth. If you're interested in ever talking about the group that we have at Echo Glen and the history behind it, I'm glad to uh, talk about that. But I, this has given me the idea that maybe we need to name it the Echo Glen GSA. Who knows? Right. I appreciate you. If you have hung out here till the end, thank you. And uh, like the video, subscribe to the page. Thanks. Bye.